Hello and welcome to this introduction to evolution video. I'm Dr. Alan Roberts and in this video we're going to look at the process of speciation and the emergence of a brand new species and the mechanisms that allow this to happen. Now the diversity of life on earth stems from a fundamental process in evolutionary biology known as speciation. And in its simplest form, speciation is the evolutionary process by which populations evolve to become a new species. In other words, it's the formation of a new and distinct species from existing species through a range of different evolutionary mechanisms. Now there are two key principal mechanisms by which speciation can occur and they both revolve around whether the populations are isolated geographically or not. So when we have geographical isolation, populations are physically separated from one another and so they cannot interact with one another. And if they cannot interact, they cannot interbreed, resulting in divergence over time. Now this type of speciation is more commonly associated with animals and is known as allopatric speciation. And when there is non-geographical isolation, it is known as sympatric speciation and is more commonly associated with plants. And this is where the populations remain in the same area and so they can interact with one another, but certain other evolutionary sub-mechanisms prevent interbreeding from happening. So let's look at all of these in a little more detail, starting with allopatric speciation. This is derived from two Latin terms, allos meaning different and patra meaning homeland. So putting them together, we get different homeland. And essentially, allopatric speciation is where gene flow is interrupted when a large population is geographically divided into subpopulations that are unable to interact with one another and therefore gene flow stops between the populations. And so if we look at an example, here we have a landscape that is split by a small widening river. Now this particular landscape is inhabited by squirrels, which represents our parental population. And there are two things to note about squirrels. One, they hate getting their fur wet, and two, they can only jump short distances. Now in its current state, the small thin river can be traversed by squirrels jumping across the banks from trees on either side. But what happens if there was a catastrophic event, resulting in torrential rain, flash flooding, and ultimately the widening of the river? Well, at this point, there is no longer a safe place for the squirrels to cross the river. And what we end up with is two different subpopulations. This essentially stops gene flow between the two newly created subpopulations. However, it does allow for gene flow within the population. Now, each of these populations are susceptible to a range of different mechanisms. The founder's effect will play a large part in the trajectory of the population, but it will also be affected by natural selection. So the foods or predators that are present, they will be affected by mutations, genetic drift, etc, etc. And so over time, these two subpopulations will become reproductively isolated from the original parental population and from one another. And if enough time passes, it will result in speciation and the generation of a new species via allopatric speciation. And so if we bring in a real world example of allopatric speciation, we have the antelope squirrels found in the Grand Canyon. And what was once a single population has since been split into two distinct species, the Amospermophilus leucurus, identified by its white tail, and the Amospermophilus harrisi, identified by its grey tail. And the reason for this was the rise of mountain ranges and the formation of valleys, which physically isolated two different populations. Then, over time, they would have been subjected to different environmental conditions and pressures, resulting in divergent evolution in morphological, behavioural or physical attributes. This occurs through evolutionary history until the two species become reproductively isolated from one another. Now moving on, we have our second mechanism of speciation, which is sympatric speciation. Now this is a lot less common than allopatric speciation, but it is more common in plant species. 
and essentially sympatric speciation is where gene flow is disrupted without geographical isolation. Therefore, the populations can still technically interact with one another as they are not physically separated. Now by its definition, sympatric speciation can be a little more challenging to understand how gene flow is prevented without the help of a physical barrier. Now there are in fact several mechanisms by which gene flow can be interrupted during sympatric speciation. We have polyploidy, sexual selection and habitat differentiation. And so very generally, polyploidy is where the number of chromosomes in an organism's cell doubles. This can arise due to errors in DNA replication or through hybridization of two species. But essentially, the polyploid individual would not be able to reproduce with its diploid counterparts, leading to immediate reproductive isolation. Next we have sexual selection, which is where the preference for certain mates leads to divergence within a population, so where some females prefer males with a specific trait or vice versa, which over time could lead to two reproductively isolated groups. And finally there is habitat differentiation, whereby populations might adapt to different ecological niches within the same area so they might exploit different food resources and therefore over time this can lead to reproductive isolation. And so let's have a look at each of these in a little more detail, starting with our polyploidy, which is a condition in where an organism has more than two complete sets of chromosomes. Now most animals and plants are diploid, meaning they have two sets of chromosomes, one from each parent, however, if there is an accident during the cell division process, the number of chromosomes can change, and so long as this results in a viable offspring, they will have a number of different chromosomes to each parent. Now polyploidy can arise from two distinct mechanisms. We have autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy. Autopolyploidy is derived from the Greek word autos, meaning self, and therefore Autopolyploidy is when an individual has more than two chromosome sets from a single parental species. And on the flip side, allopolyploidy is derived from the Greek word allos, meaning other, and therefore allopolyploidy is when an individual has more than two chromosome sets from multiple parental species which have hybridized. And so let's have a look at each of these in a little more detail to see how they arise. Here we can see a diploid cell undergoing cell division. Now during the cell division process, the chromosomes are duplicated and once the genetic content has doubled, the cell will begin to divide in two. But what if there's a problem and the cell doesn't divide, but it has already duplicated all of the chromosomes? Well, the resulting cell would have twice the number of chromosomes, and so our diploid cell becomes a tetraploid cell, meaning it has four sets of chromosomes. Now the key thing here is that whilst this cell is tetraploid, it can technically still go on to form viable offspring, producing diploid gametes via meiosis. Now this tetraploid organism is reproductively isolated from the diploid parental population because if the diploid gametes fuse with a haploid gamete, they'd produce a triploid offspring which has significantly reduced fertility. And so fertilization where two diploid gametes come together either via self-pollination in plants or via mating with other diploids in animals it will result in a tetraploid zygote and the production of a viable fertile offspring. And essentially because this new tetraploid is reproductively isolated from the original species, despite being in the same geographical area, it has become its own species. And so in just a single generation, we have a speciation event whereby species B has evolved directly from species A. And essentially that is how we have speciation from a single parental species, aka autopolyploidy. Now let's look at when multiple parental species are involved. 
So here we can see two species, species A and B, which are going to interbreed together to produce a hybrid offspring. Now for the most part, as we've learned previously, hybrids are sterile because the chromosomes are not homologous. However, it is possible for them to reproduce asexually, although this is much less common. So if we look at the process, here we can see species A and B are both diploid, and therefore, during successful meiosis, they are able to produce viable haploid gametes, and if there is interbreeding between the two, this will result in fertilization, whereby a hybrid zygote is formed. The problem with this zygote is that it is sterile and not able to produce viable offspring due to chromosome mismatching. Essentially, the chromosomes are unable to pair during the process of meiosis. However, there are two things which could be done to rectify this. The first, as I mentioned earlier, is to undergo asexual reproduction. This is common in plants because they are able to self-pollinate and therefore this would allow for successful chromosome pairing. The second method purposely relies on a mitotic or meiotic error that doubles the chromosome number as we've seen previously. And so after either of these events, we would produce a fertile polyploid designated species C, which is the result of interbreeding between species A and species B. And so that is polypoidy sympatric speciation, and that's the hard bit out of the way. We'll quickly look at the other two, which are a lot easier to understand, starting with sexual selection. So this is where populations are in the same location, hence it satisfies the criteria for sympatric speciation, but we get reproductive barriers forming as sexual partners are selected for because of certain appearances, traits or behaviours. And a good example of sexual selection resulting in sympatric speciation are in cichlids. You see, female cichlids have a preference for males with a certain stripe and colour pattern, leading to assortive mating whereby females only mate with certain males, and over time, this results in the discrimination being strengthened. Now this will continue until sexual selection and this mating preference contributes to genetic divergence, which over time can be strengthened to the point of speciation. Now moving on, our final variation of sympatric speciation is habitat differentiation, and this is where populations are in the same location, again relating to sympatric speciation, but we get reproductive barriers forming as a result of different subpopulations preferring specific resources or limiting themselves to a specific habitat. Now the key point is that these resources or habitats are not used by the parental population. So as an example, here we have some mole rats on a mountainside and let's say there is some geological event that alters the soil type in a certain area of the mountainside. Some subpopulations might prefer the habitat with the lighter soil, whilst other subpopulations might prefer the habitat with the darker soil. And so whilst these two habitats are adjacent to one another, over time, each subpopulation becomes reproductively isolated in their distinct habitats due to their preference for different soil types. This essentially means there is no interbreeding between the two populations and therefore no gene flow. And a good example of this are the blind mole rats of the Galilee Mountains. Two subpopulations have evolved from an ancestral population into what we call today Spalax Galilei and Spalax Arembergi. This is due to a geological event that altered the acidity of certain soils. Some mole rats subpopulations had tongue papillae that preferred one soil type whilst other subpopulations preferred the other soil type. And essentially, this leads to reproductive isolation over time to the point of speciation. And essentially, that is habitat differentiation, which concludes our look at different sympatric speciation mechanisms.
Now in this final part of the video, we are going to look at hybrid zones, which is something which goes against our biological species concept, which for the most part is built upon reproductive isolation and the building of barriers to prevent different species from mating. However, hybrid zones represent a geographical area where two distinct species, but closely related ones, can meet and interbreed with one another, producing offspring with mixed ancestry known as hybrids. So if we look at an example of this, here we can see three subpopulations within a species, which by their very definition, interbreed with one another, facilitating gene flow throughout the ancestral population. Now at some point in time, one of these subpopulations might become isolated from the ancestral population. Now as time progresses, a reproductive barrier of some sort will start to form and could potentially develop to a point whereby reproductive isolation is a certainty. And then at this point, these different subpopulations will be sent down completely different pathways. And over time, different populations will diversify genetically to the point where there is reinforcement of reproductive barriers. And so the populations we can see at the top have diversified away from the main population on the bottom. But there might become a time where reproductive barriers start to lessen or degrade. And if these two different species find themselves in the same geographical area, then due to the weakening reproductive barriers, there could be potential for them to meet and interbreed. And we call these geographical locations hybrid zones. And that is because they can give rise to hybrid offspring with mixed ancestry that enables gene flow between different ancestral populations. Now, once hybrids have been established, one of the three things can occur. We can get a process of reinforcement whereby natural selection strengthens reproductive barriers between species. Now this happens because hybrids often have reduced fitness, most likely because they are less adapted to their environment or less successful in reproducing. And so as a result, selection favours individuals that avoid mating with members of the other species. And this reinforces the difference between the species with the hybrids ceasing to form. Next, we have the process of fusion, whereby two that initially hybridise start to merge back into a single genetically mixed population. However, this is usually done when hybrids are fit or fitter than the parental populations and when there are no significant barriers to gene flow between the populations. Essentially, we can see sort of a reversal of the speciation process as the lines between the two start to blur. And finally, we might get a process of stability whereby the hybrid zone becomes a stable and persistent feature of the landscape. Now this stability usually occurs when hybrids have a fitness advantage to the specific conditions of the hybrid zone, even if they are less fit in the habitats of the parental species. Now hybrids will continue to be formed and they have the potential to migrate into either parental populations, facilitating gene transfer between the two. Now this video will have continually been trying to identify at what point a population becomes a new species or a subspecies becomes a common species. And as we have discussed, evolution via natural selection results in change over time, and this will lead to diversification and sometimes speciation. And so there are two theoretical frameworks that describe the tempo and the specification of the process. We have a punctuated model representing a relatively quick transition, which is in contrast to the gradual model, which represents a much slower transition period. And so if we were to look at these in more detail, starting with the punctuated model, which was first proposed in the 1970s and suggests that species remain in a period of stasis where they are stable and resistant to change. 
then at some point this stability is punctuated by a short and rapid burst of significant evolution. So as an example, here we can see species A which has been in a stasis for a prolonged period of time. Then there is a period of rapid change, resulting in new populations, which is different enough to the point it doesn't interbreed and therefore is given a brand new species name, species B. Then this new species and the original species go back to a period of prolonged stasis and evolution over time. Now the interesting thing about this model by far is that it challenges the traditional view that species evolve through a slow and steady accumulation of genetic changes. And instead, this change is the result of key genetic changes such as single nucleotide substitutions or single event errors that lead to catastrophic reproductive isolation that immediately separates subpopulations from the main population. And finally, we have the gradual model. This is what we generally think of when we talk about evolution, a slow and gradual change in species that at some point results in a new species developing. Now this is less black and white compared to the punctuated model, and it's more of a grayscale, as sometimes it can be quite difficult to determine the time in which one species becomes another. So as an example, here we can see species A, which is split into two subpopulations. One subpopulation continues to represent species A, but another accumulates small changes over time, which eventually result in the emergence of species B. Now, one of the most important questions here is when does species B start and when does species B stop being species A? Is it here? Is it here? Or could it be here? Now, due to the gradual changes that accumulate, it can be extremely difficult to determine even with well-preserved and extensive documented fossil records. And so I think a more holistic approach has to be taken when looking at different evidences for gradual and punctuated models. Now this gradual change is commonly associated with multiple genetic, biological and morphological changes as a result of changes in the environment. So over time, this results in the formation of a reproductive barrier that strengthens to the point of reproductive isolation and the generation of a brand new species. And with that, we come to the end of this video. Hopefully you found the content useful, informative, and most importantly, easy to understand. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.